Okay, welcome. Welcome and hello. I am Denise Wakeman, your guide to more visibility on the web. I am also your host today in this very special show where we're going to be talking about adult learning preferences for business content. And that's that's very specific. And so we're going to be talking about why that's important for you today for your business. Now, before we get started, I just got a couple of requests for you. Um, if at any time during the conversation with Karen, uh, you can go ahead and type in the chat, uh, whether it's over to your right, your left or below you, you know, I don't know what device you're on. So you have to find it yourself, but there's a chat. And some of you have found that uh, you can type in your question. If you type the letter Q and a slash, then a space and type your question, that'll highlight it for us and then i'll be able to i'll notice it the other thing is if you would do us a big favor and click the tell little bird button that will tweet it out to your followers and let them know that we're here live having this conversation that would be a very helpful thing to do um and uh because i kind of messed things up and so we don't have the same audience that we would have had but they'll get the replay um <laughs> and then the other thing is we just gave Karen props. Those are the two little hands. If you like something she's saying, please give her props. You know, that's how we show our love here. We're going to be talking for, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, perhaps. And then I'm going to open up the um, the seats. We have two, two more seats that we can open up. Right now they're locked so we can have a good clean conversation, no, you know, no noisy stuff in the background. After that, we'll open up and you can answer any question or answer. You can answer the questions that Karen <laughs> might have. <laughs> uh, or Karen can answer some questions you have, or I can answer them, uh, or somebody can answer them. So you can ask them in the chat. You can ask them live if you're on it, you've got your webcam going. So let's get rolling here. Uh, my <laughs> guest today is Karen Greenstreet of Passion for Business. And Karen recently conducted a survey. Uh, she'll give us the exact numbers, but I know it was close to 2,000 people uh, answered the survey. And it's about adult learning preferences and specifically around business topics, because that's our concern here. If you're a coach, consultant, trainer, teacher, um, you want to know how your audience best learns your content. And every couple of years, Karen does a survey like this, and she's been tracking the trends for a while now. I'm going to get that information too. So she's got the data that show clear changes and trends and evolution and how we as adults like to learn our content. Let me tell you a little bit about Karen and then we'll dive into the questions. And um, so I didn't memorize this, so I'm going to read it. <laughs> Karen Greenstreet is an internationally known self-employment expert and small business consultant. She has owned six businesses since 1981. That is damn impressive. She has spoken at numerous national conferences on business strategy and marketing to topics and has taught over 270,000 people worldwide. Every two years, Karen conducts the learning survey research study to tap into the changing ways adults prefer to learn. Welcome, Karen, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thanks so much, Denise. Sorry about the techie problems. <laughs> no problem, that's, you know, it, they happen. You know, that's the way things are. Mm -hmm. um, and you're here now and that's all that all that matters so i want to start by getting a little background to for the people who may or may not have taken the survey maybe they were on your call uh last week or a couple of weeks ago but just to give a little background about the survey when did you start it what made you decide you wanted to do do the survey how many people took it that kind of thing well the first time i did the survey was just to my own audience that was back in 2005 because i wanted to know how they prefer to learn because technology was changing so rapidly and i wanted to see if they even knew what a webinar was or a teleseminar or so forth then starting in 2008 i opened it up to the public and so this is the fourth time i've done it i usually do it every two years or so um just to really find out what are the trends and what's changing? And the interesting thing, of course, is during that time, there was the recession. And so that played a big uh, part in what people were saying, how they preferred to learn. 
and here it is on you know now it's 10 years later and the changes about the way people like to receive educational content and their flexibility in the different ways they can has has morphed over time it's really it's fascinating it's absolutely fascinating what's what's equally fascinating is not just the numbers but what people are telling me in the comments you know why they're making these choices and, and what's going on in their world that makes them make these choices okay great well let's get to that in a minute so um to I'll further set the stage why is it important that we have this information what what is it that you know you feel like it, that getting this out to so many people because a lot of people shared this the survey a lot of people are sharing the results what what is it that's so important about having this so as a business well, owner yeah as a business owner i mean if you're teaching and when i say teaching i don't mean teaching just like in a live class i mean you know webinars and teleseminars and blog posts and videos and podcasts i mean there's so many ways of teaching now but if you're providing educational content to your audience you need to know um not only what is their most important way that they prefer to learn? You know, if they if they're only given one choice, what is it? But also, what are the different ways that they're flexible enough to say, well, you know, if I can't have my favorite way, what else can I have? And you need to keep your fingers on the pulse of that because you might be providing content in a certain way and people have changed and you're not keeping up with the times. You may notice your enrollments are going down. You may notice your participation is going down. Um, you may notice your revenue is going down. Um, and so you need to know what's going on with these things. And you need to know also what are people asking for in adjunct to educational content what what are their concerns and what are they asking about so just keeping your finger on the pulse of all of this is the way that you're going to keep your business relevant and let's face it there's plenty of content available out there on the internet right now so if you are delivering it the way they want you're going to be head and shoulders above the other people who aren't paying attention right right and you know there's as you said so many ways to deliver content and content is typically you know educational or or you know entertainment let's say <laughs> <laughs> and uh so it's important to for us you know whether you're coaching too i mean that's a way uh, a method of teaching or mentoring consulting you know i feel that you know in my role as a consultant and mentor that i actually teach people you know i show them how to do something right. so how do they want to get that information so that they actually make progress mm -hmm. or can take action that they want to do so um why don't you tell us a little bit about how you designed the survey the questions you asked and then we'll go into some of the results because i think that your choice of questions um is interesting as well to and do you do you maintain the the types of questions or the style of question every time you do the survey? Yeah, no. So 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 to start with, no. I I redesign the survey each time because what I'm finding is um, because of the complexity of all the different ways they can learn. There's I don't know. I think I had like 25 possible ways they can learn. It was starting to get confusing. And to use good survey techniques, I had to allow for randomized answers that it wasn't the same answer at the top of the form each time because we know that people tend to pick the first answer that shows up. So this time, um, I asked very specifically, I divided into ways of, of, of learning or absorbing educational information and it divided it into reading, um, watching or listening is sort of the same combo area and then attending which are more like live things whereas watching and listening are recordings mm -hmm. and then other because you know there's all kinds of other ways of learning um i did ask them things like you know what topics are you interested in or what other ways do you like to learn or any other comments you have for me but those questions were peripheral really what i wanted them to do was tell me how you know if you're given a choice and you're trying to learn a new topic how do you like to learn it now, the particular audience who was taking this survey were a lot of business owners. So of course, their preferences might be slightly different, but it gives you a sense of what's changing and what are what are the adoption rates of new technology and so forth. And also, now that the economy is getting a little better, does that have an effect on the, the selections? So yeah, every year I change the survey so I have a pretty good idea of, of what it is I'm asking, asking about. Like as an example, uh, two years ago, I asked them what 
you know, when you're learning on a, a device, a, an online device, what are you using? A, a PC, a laptop, a, a tablet, or whatever. I don't ask that question anymore because everybody's so ambidextrous with their devices that it almost doesn't matter. Whereas right. two years ago and four years ago, I did have to ask them, do you have an MP3 player? Now it's like, well, of course I do. Everyone does, you know? <laughs> um, so those kind of questions tend to tend to fall off when they're not really important anymore. Right. So it really comes down to the actual way that the information is being consumed by them. Right. Right. And and it's it's now device agnostic. It doesn't matter right. because they can just do anything. Although, yeah. of course, if you have a cell phone and you're using cell phone minutes, you're not going to be watching a lot of videos. But, you know, <laughs> overall, <laughs> people do have choices now. Yeah. Right. Right. And so many people have unlimited minutes now that even that doesn't matter. Right. You know, right. just battery power. Right. <laughs> So basically, um, I, I, I uh, printed out, you know, like that, that first question that you have, because just in case some people, you know, haven't had an opportunity to see the survey or the results yet. And so I just want to quickly, you know, talk about like the specific areas that you were looking at, because they right. did flow through, um, you know, all the questions. Right, so you right. asked about, um, learning on my own at my own pace but i also want to interact with the students and instructors so that was one option i prefer to learn on my own at my own pace and that's more right. like an online course reading a book listening to an audio watching video so you're just me me in the screen right <laughs> uh or the ear earbud right, right. um i prefer to learn in a live setting with an instructor and other students so in-person workshops in-person training courses right. or conference or right. something like right. that which i just attended one for the first time in ages this past yeah, weekend yeah and I'm glad I did, you know, I mean, I it's people. like, oh, wow, there's people out here, you know, <laughs> usually it's just me and my cat here. Um, then there's, I prefer to le lear learn in a live virtual setting with an instructor and other students. So that can be webinars, teleseminars, for example. And then I prefer to work one-on-one -on -one with someone. So a coach, a mentor, a private teacher. And it's funny because I choose all of them, except you wouldn't let us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I made you choose one. <laughs> that was a very hard decision make. I don't even remember what decision I made because it probably depended on that moment, you know, in time. Right, because I've right. been working with mentors for for years, and I probably make the biggest leaps, you know, in that environment. But you know. Right. And I think I think the answer, answer for to the, every single thing, the, the answer to the question actually depends on well, what topic is it? How much do I know about it? But what I was trying to do, I was trying to to sort of force people to narrow down and make make a choice given the unknownness of everything. But people do have a preference. This is this survey is not about learning styles and how do you learn best? It's what is your go to thing when you want to learn something new? What is the first thing you do? Like for me, it's a book. I, the first thing I do is look to see if there's a book or a, a really long blog post on it. But that's just my preference is to read. And I'll tell you, the only part of the reason I realized that's my preference is I can read twice as fast as I can listen or watch. So it's time constrained. <laughs> right. More than anything. But but we all have these sort of things we we gravitate towards. And so this first question, I wanted to try to get a sense of what's what's your norm when you when you first think about something, what do you normally pick? Right, right, good, okay. So um, what are some of the results, the top results that you discovered and were there any surprises that you so, so when found? So this question, this year we did divide virtual live events like something like this, like a blab, like a webinar, like a teleseminar, we divided them from live in-person classes and conferences and things because we, we wanted to make that distinction. Um, but even with that said, the vast majority of people chose that they wanted to learn on their own. Now it was sort of between learning on their own but having an instructor available and having the other students available, that was important. Um, mm -hmm. but, but this self-paced nature um, was what a lot of people were basically saying, this is what they wanted. And what they were saying about that was, 
when it's a new topic or when it's a complicated topic, I want to be able to sort of rewind and listen to it again or watch it again or read it again. And when they go to a live class or a live conference, it feels like this huge funnel of information coming at them and they can't pause and process. Now, the cool thing about that is if you're a teacher and you're doing live classes, what can you do in your live classes to give them that space to do that? It's not like live classes can't have this. It's just that they don't normally have this, but this is what people are asking for. Right. So um, the other interesting thing is two years ago and then two years before that, people saying that they wanted to go to live events was very decreased. And I think it was the recession. People are just like, unless they're, in, unless, unless they're next door, I can't afford to go. Um, now they're saying, you know, I got a little bit of money. And if I really, if it was a really important topic and I wanted to cut, carve time out of my calendar and get away from the office and really focus, I would go to a live event. And so um, that number has increased dramatically from two years ago, which I think is good news. It's really good news. And you just said you went to a live event. So you're, you're, you're the know. child. <laughs> and it was a one day event, which I noticed in your, in your results that people were more inclined to want to go to a live event if it was a half day or a full day, but not multiple days right and i think the reason for that is twofold first of all they're going to assume that a one-day event is probably local or a half day event is probably local and the other thing is is because they can manage the amount of information they could receive in a half a day or a full day whereas three or four or five days um they're starting to get overwhelmed and that's a real issue with uh teaching any kind of teaching is are you overwhelming your students and how are you managing that because we see dropout rates increasing because people are just they're like okay i've had enough and i i can't implement what you've taught me and you want to teach me six more weeks of it i need to stop right 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 yeah and i mean there, it's an interesting um it's an interesting space to be in is finding the sweet spot of what the right mode of teaching is for what you're teaching for what the topic is exactly you know? and you can't do them all i mean when i look at this list of all the possible ways that you can learn i mean it's, it's i mean it's huge you can't say it see it's a huge list of possible ways and you can't you as the teacher as the education content provider you can't do all these ways unless you have either a huge staff or unlimited money or somehow miraculously you have unlimited time which none of us have uh, right so so choosing the right um delivery method for the topic and for your audience becomes more and more important from a business strategy standpoint because otherwise your pro your profitability could go down and your number of enrollments could go down if you try to do too many ways or right. you don't do enough ways so right. luckily with technology the cool thing is is technology allows us to convert live classes to webinars and webinars to audios and we can do all this conversion if we just can think um like an instructional designer and say okay i i need to to think of this delivery method and design my material to be delivered in that way as effectively as possible because mm -hmm. obviously in a live room i can get people up and you know dancing in the hallway i can't do that on a webinar so what how am i going to convert that so conversion right. becomes an issue now Right. So I just ha I have a question for the audience. Um, if you could just type into the comments there, like, what's your preferred learning style? You know, is it um, uh, at your own pace, but interaction with other people? And of course, that includes things like having a private group too, like a Facebook group. I mm -hmm. think that has mm -hmm. changed things quite dramatically in the yeah. last few years. Almost every course that I take has a private Facebook group. And I think specifically to address what you're saying about having some of that interaction because you know you have questions or or you want support or whatever. So if you guys just type in and just like, is it you prefer to learn at your own pace but want to interact with others? Do you prefer just simply to learn on your own at your own pace? Like forget the other people. You just want to do it yourself. <laughs> uh, do you prefer a live setting with an instructor? So when you're attending something live with other people in the room. Real humans. Versus, 
a virtual setting. So like this is a virtual setting, you know, there's nobody in the room, we're in a virtual room, uh, but, and, and we're live or one-on-one -on -one, like with a mentor or coach or something. So I just like to get a uh, sense here. So Paula says at my own pace with interaction, private group, live teaching, video or reading or audio, occasional short in person in real life. Joselito, I like self-paced and group plus some form of accountability. Live webinar with others from Tina, excellent. Trudy, reading at your own pace and having a Facebook group. Good, well, that's a, that's a pretty, um, I think that's all fairly similar there. Yeah. So it's, it's like the virtual with some other aspect of connection with other people. So. And the um, interesting thing is Joselito brings up a good point because one of the, the findings we found in this study was that people um, wanted to learn they, they enjoyed, you know, being able to interact with the teacher and interact with the other students, but they wanted the accountability and the implementation piece. They liked classes combined with like a mastermind group so that they could have both pieces of that because they felt that otherwise they would just take the material, they would stick it up on a shelf, they wouldn't get to it. But if there was this ongoing support that they could have um, and being held accountable for getting things done, they really love that combination. And so what we're seeing is, I think people are busy, they're time constrained, they're distracted. And so whatever way as a teacher, you can help them not just to learn, but to implement, I think is really important. And that we saw mm -hmm. a lot of that in, in the survey results. Right, right. Otherwise, it's like uh, what they call it shelf help or throwing, <laughs> throwing money at the problem. And that's like, you know, yeah, yeah, nothing happens. And exactly. that, that's frustrating for everyone. You know, that's frustrating. I, I feel like it's, I speak for myself is that, you know, people sign up for a program and then don't do anything. They never show up. And it's like, ah, why? You know, I wish right. I just hadn't, you know, because right. then I feel like I'm not delivering, you know, but you know, that's, uh, I can't, we can't control the others, other people. And we're right? seeing it really common because people are um, time warping a little bit that if you do a free webinar or a paid webinar or a free teleclass or a paid teleclass, that you get a whole bunch of people sign up, but then all, somewhere between 10 to 40% actually show up live. And you're thinking, well, where is everybody? And primarily it's because we're so busy and so time constrained that if there's a recording, I'm going to take advantage of that if I can't make that live event. Well, that's all well mm -hmm. and good, but as a teacher, how do you know they've learned if you're not interacting with them? So that again, goes back to that whole instructional design. How are you going to design a class that's great for the people who are participating live and also great for the people who are list who are participating um, through the recording of it. So right, these, right. These are challenges. Yeah, you know, one of the things you mentioned is, um, I think, can't remember what word you used, but, you know, I use the word repurposing. And, um, you know, that you mentioned that you can do a webinar and you can, you know, strip the audio. You know, this was in the report and also you, met, you alluded to this. So there's so many ways that we can um, give our students uh whatever their preferred way of getting the information is i mean you do a transcript <laughs> you know right right uh, so i mean that's already three ways if you've got some kind of live component whether it's on video or you've got an audio component you can do a, a written component so right there that's probably the fastest easiest way it doesn't it's not that much more expense probably the transcribing is the biggest expense in that uh, in that element there. Um, so right. did you find that that was something that people wanted to have multiple ways to consume the information? No, I didn't see, I mean, they can, um, but what I find that people are saying was, you know, if, if they had, if it was possible, if they were say watching a video or watching a webinar and then there were notes, um, that they were handed that they could then sort of follow along with the notes. Some people found that con that very convenient. Other people um, will tell you, I mean, there's a, a lot of studies on it that people taking their own notes learn better. And so mm -hmm. handing them the notes actually might be a negative thing. Um, and so what kind of note taking device can you give them where they actually have to be more interactive? The more you can get them to connect with the material, use it, implement it, pay attention to it, learn it, 
um, the more they're going to retain it because we've got like this much short-term memory and like this much <laughs> long-term <laughs> memory and it's getting, right. it's getting smaller and smaller. So part of this is understanding the, the psychology of how people um, convert this short-term information to long-term memory and what you can do to make that happen even if they're doing it offline self-paced on their own right what are the devices you can use so these are all um things that are coming up for these people but yeah if i said to people um you know what if you could only watch a video most of them would say okay you know i'll do that unless they just hate videos but most people can adapt right look i can binge watch downton abbey for six hours straight but i can't watch a three minute youtube video come on I mean, it's not, there's, there's a motivational factor here as well that right. people have to want to learn <laughs> right right exactly so um one of the questions you asked which i thought was interesting and i'm kind of wondering what what you glean from it is um you asked how do adults prefer not to learn yeah it's really interesting because i think it's important that we understand that people um have preferences and and some of the preferences have degraded over time so as an example um i in every section so there's a section on reading how do you prefer to read do you prefer to read a physical book uh an ebook like a pdf or on a e-reader um, and then there was always the question i don't prefer to learn this way and it's interesting because as an example audio audio recordings of materials 23% of people said they didn't like to learn through audio recordings. And when we actually divided that out, we saw that um, people, you know, as they go through the different things, as example, they like audio, um, like audio recordings from maybe a teleseminar, but they didn't particularly um, feel like they could learn through audio podcasts because often podcasts are an interview format and there's not a set agenda. There's not exercises. There's, it's not, it's not educational in the traditional sense, but yeah, I mean, we, like I'm looking here, um, 23% said they didn't prefer to listen to audios. 14% said they did not, did not prefer to learn at a live event, a physical face-to-face -face event. Um, uh, 12% said they did not prefer to watch videos. And then only 3% said they did not like to read, which is interesting because we know that um, a very large percentage of people, at least in the United States, are at a, a, a relatively minimal level of reading literacy. And this is adults. And people always say as an example, oh, well, my audience is different though. They're very educated and I'm saying, wait a minute. I work with a client, he has a $23 million business and he way prefers to watch videos and audios versus read. And it's not like he can't read, it's just he prefers to watch videos right. and audios, that's his style. And so we just need to be aware that some people just don't like to read, but in, in our surveys, uh, findings, it's a very small percentage. So you almost always can do well by having some component where they have to read something. So um, what is your advice for business owners who do teaching, training, coaching, consulting, <laughs> mentoring, like <laughs> probably every single person, uh, you know, that entrepreneur that I know <laughs> and who I know is on this uh, on this in the audience right now and who will probably be watching this later. Uh, you know, we we all are imparting information to our clients and students. So what should we take away from this? Well, I think the big takeaways, two big takeaways are um, people are preferring self paced material um, with a access to an instructor and the other students. And so what we're seeing is this concept called flipping the classroom. And it started in grade schools and stuff, but adults are doing it as well. And the concept of flipping the classroom basically means instead of providing lecture material live, I mean, remember, try to remember back when you were like eight, nine, 10 years old, lecture materials live, and then your exercises, your homework, they were all done outside of class. So we're now flipping that. We're saying, wait a minute, provide them with the educational material in pre-recorded or pre-written content, and then all the discussions, all the exercises, all the homework, um, all the planning, implementing, that happens actually in the live sessions. 
So as an example, you might see a class where there is, you know, four weeks of video training and that's content. But then once a week, there is a open Q&A call or there's a homework call or you're assigned a project partner or something where the live part of it is uh, all about using the material that you learned. And of course, you you get on these calls and if you're on the call and you haven't consume the material, then you're behind. So it kind of forces people to consume that material because getting people to consume educational material, whether it's paid or free, is is a real puzzle. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to write a blog post on that one because that's I've got I've got ideas about getting them to to consume it, but it's tough. Um, but the flipping the classroom idea is very, very helpful. The other thing that we're seeing a trend is that people really do like to watch videos. And I don't mean videos like a recording of a webinar. They want to see faces. I think part of that is, is that we're just missing people. We, right. you know, the online world is great and you think you're talking to people, but you're actually feeling a distance from them because it's a lot of it's text based. And so video like video chats like this or recorded videos, they get to see the teacher, they get to see the other students and they get to see what's going on. And um, the big one of the big trends in the in the survey was that they prefer um, video recordings, but video over audio recordings or um written lesson material when they had to learn. So those are two big takeaways that people need to be paying attention to. Okay, I hope you guys all heard that. <laughs> <laughs> video, yep. video, yep. and uh, yeah. So, you know, listening to all this, I it, there are several people in the audience who uh, just, uh, who have been in my online visibility challenges this past year. Um, I just, completed a series of six and I'm relaunching it shortly. And I think that I have, before ever hearing this, this these survey results, I have done what you are suggesting. <laughs> <laughs> because what I created was a situation where it was like 20 to 30 minutes of teaching in a webinar, in a video webinar kind of style, but live. And then they get the video, they get the audio stripped out, they get the slides. Um, I didn't do transcripts, but then we have a very, very, very active uh, Facebook group where the implementation goes in. And I did some gamification in that it was a challenge every week, not a daily challenge, but a weekly challenge. Right. And I did a random drawing, you know, and gave a prize to, you know, I did a drawing from whoever participated. Yeah. You know, yeah got very high participation rate and I got very high uh, renewal rate too. Right, right. Well, as an example, one of my classes I teach, um, we do it as a teleseminar, which is not a popular way to do it, but it's a highly interactive class. There's lots of class discussion going on and we do a practice session in every single class. And so even though it's a teleseminar, which is not the popular way of, of delivering training, almost everybody shows up for class because there's this practice session and there's this real hands-on component to it that they wouldn't get um, if we have to sort of fight with video technology or right. whatever. And especially, you know, some video rooms, they only let you have a certain number of people. Um, and so part of it is trying to find ways of making your material more engaging, trying to get your audience to participate and apply what you're learning, but then also to read these survey results with a little grain of salt to say, well, wait a minute, is what I'm delivering so important that it needs to be done like in a, a in in text because it's this huge step-by-step -step process. And if I try to explain it, they'll lose their place. But if I give it to them in a book, then they'll get it. So right. it, You've got to know your audience. You've got to know your material when you're when you're selecting the right training method. Right. So, do you think it's worth uh, spending the time, or do you think that or that we should be doing this is surveying our specific audiences to find out how they want to get our training? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing you can do that's going to be better for you. And I mean, we we try to keep our fingers on the pulse of what our audience is telling us that they want as far as topics. I mean, they'll write to say, hey, are you going to teach a class on this? Um, but 
actively going out and surveying them and saying, look, I want to serve you in the best way possible. But the only way I can do that is by you telling me, how do you like to learn? And right. does it matter if it's a new topic for you or whether it's like the advanced version? Um, you may find that people say, well, if it's a new topic for me, I want to do it self-paced. But if it's an advanced level where it's a lot of um, uh, deep thinking and deep discussions and thought provoking questions and exercises and things like that. Wow. I really want that to be live. Right. So maybe they'll do self paced for the intro class, but then they want a three, they do want a three day weekend with you um, to really deep dive into something. So right. I would ask that question as well. Right. Good. Okay. So, so, and you know, that's a great way to stay connected with your audience too. And, you know, be, because that's what people want. They want to know that you're listening to them. So start with the survey. <laughs> and uh, I keep looking over at the comments. So, yeah, I'm talking to you, but really, <laughs> sorry. Uh, there was one question uh, that I want to get to also uh, from Scott Scowcroft. And he said, what role will Udemy, like online courses, play in terms of adult education going forward. Do you have any thoughts on that, Karen? Well, Udemy is an online platform, um, a hosted platform, meaning they'll host your material. And they're just like any of these, because there's Rizuku, there's a couple others, one of mm -hmm. them as well. Um, and on one hand, they're very convenient for the teacher because you don't have to worry about the technology part of it. All you have to do is create the content. Um, they're for each typically for each lesson there's a place underneath the lesson where people can leave comments but for me i'd want the next level which is well then how do i have some interactivity with these folks uh concurrent at the same time instead of this asynchronous where they post something at two o'clock in the morning and i get up at eight and i post some stuff um right. where can we implement some live things and i don't know um, where Udemy is going with their platform and what their plans are. But I'd love to see almost like work groups or um, project, a place to do projects together or a place to uh, do some very high level accountability and just you know, some other tools. But I, right. love, I love these tools because they free up the teacher to not have to worry about the technology side of it. Right. On the reverse side, you need to be very careful with any of these hosted um, platforms is that you need to make sure that if you put your class up there and then you decide you want to take it down later, you can. Some of them have rules that say, once you put your class up here, it's in our library, you're never allowed to take it down. That may not be good, good as part of your business strategy. So please read the fine print before you make any choices. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't have any classes on any of them, but <laughs> I like to keep it all on my own platform, you yeah. know, if, if I can. But uh, okay. Yeah, so I'm a big if, fan of of owning your own platform because what if? Uh, no offense, but what if Udemy goes away? What if Facebook goes away? What if right. whatever? Um, then where are you going to be? And so by putting everything on your own platform and making that um, investment, then you know you should be pretty good as far as the future of your material always being available. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Listen, I'm gonna, I'm opening up the um, seats if you're if you're okay with that, Karen. Sure. Uh, if somebody <laughs> wants to come on. If if you like have a question that you would like to ask Karen live on video, <laughs> live virtually, it's it's always it's one of those things. This is live. This is happening in real time right now. If you're here while we're doing this, but then it's virtual also because we're not in the same place and then later it's a replay so it's not live so <laughs> i don't know what to say anyway <laughs> um if you have a question for karen and want to come on to the video stream uh just uh, click on the square that says open street open seat and i will uh and bring you in um can people still take the survey? Yeah, they can take the survey. If you go to passionforbusiness.com slash learning survey, um, you can pick up the results, the report. It's free. There's no sign up or anything. Just go and pick it up. Uh, my gift to you. Um, and then also in that same blog post, there's a link to take the survey. We've had about 1,875 people take it. Um, we get 15 or 20 people taking it a day. And we started this, oh, five weeks ago, something like that. Um, we had a big push and asked all kinds of people to share it. And then that kind of closed two or three weeks ago. And we still are having people taking it over and over again. So it's great. And I'm just going to leave it open and let people take it 
for the next Great. few months if they want to. Um, but you can also look to see how I designed the survey. Uh, it's just survey monkeys, nothing fancy, uh, because that might give you a hint about how to design a survey for your own audience when you're asking them the same questions that I'm asking you. Right, right. And that's a great idea. And thank you for, you know, modeling that for people as well. I've posted the links to survey the survey monkey, the survey on survey monkey, and also a link to where you can download the results. And um, I guess we have a shy group here. They don't want to come on <laughs> video. Uh, Trudy asked a question. She says, I want to give away my how to start a service biz material. What would you say is best way to get it out? So Trudy, this is a free offer you're making. And is it is it a, truly just a gift, no sign up? Or is, or is it a business strategy as part of your marketing plan? Yes, that's what we need, Trudy. Yeah. <laughs> Type fast. Because no this, pressure. This, could be, this could be a a marketing question or it could be a how to deliver the content question. So right. maybe if you could be a little bit more specific about that, Trudy, that would be help us answer your question. Right. Um, again, there's an open seat here if anybody wants to come online, uh, come online, come on video and say hello. That's the thing with Blab now. If you want to get on video, you've got to already be prepared, you know? <laughs> and you got to be really you can't be wearing your pajamas, right? So, uh, we've got Jose Lito. Good. So, um, Trudy, real quick, if you're, um, <laughs> yes, exactly, Paula, like you've been showered. So, hey. um, if you're if you're just giving away this material and you want as many people to consume it as possible, then do consider something like Udemy or Rizuku or one of these places where there's this you know open platform and there's a lot of subscribers, and then that way you can get in front. The trick, of course, is take a look at their existing material, make sure there's not 20 other people offering relatively the same course because then you're just competing. Um, the other thing is is see if there's any business or corporation or retailer or anything, uh, chamber of commerce, whatever, that might sponsor you and get it out to their audience. And so if really the point is to get it in front of as many people as possible, find out where those people are living and, and get it out. Look, even something like Craigslist is an amazing opportunity for you to, to get material out. You'd be surprised. You I never thought, thought of that. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, Joselito. Hi, can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Yes. Yay. 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 Welcome. This is my first time for blabbing. So. Yay. Oh, wow. Yay. Oh, props. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, Joselito. I think you're going to become a blab addict. Okay. <laughs> so. you, do great on, you do great on video. <laughs> thank so. you. Thank you. So, yes, I do have a question for Karen and, and maybe you too, Denise. So um, I'm in the beginning stages of my business still, and I'm looking at creating some freebies. And so I'm just wondering with the what you learned from the survey, like, should I tailor my freebies so that they're in these different kind of delivery methods? Like, should I try to do a freebie that's a video as opposed to doing an ebook or PDF of something? Just curious if you had any thoughts about that. That is a huge question because your free offer and how people want to consume it um, make all the difference in the world. So, let, so hopefully, let, let, let me tell you a quick story, and then um, this might help you. So, I had a um, an article about how to become a small business consultant. It was getting a ton of traffic. I said, "Oh, yeah, let me give them something." So, I had a webinar recording that I put up there, and I got people to sign up for it. All the traffic that came there, a percentage, you know, seven percent or something like that, signed up for it. And then I said, "You know, this is a very unique." audience, specifically people who want to be a small business consultant, that's kind of a, a, a cohort. Let me see how this particular group prefers to learn. I swapped out the webinar with an ebook. Instead of 7% conversion rate, meaning conversion, meaning they signed up for this free thing, 23%. Wow. So okay. for that narrow little audience, they were picking that up. And what was really interesting is that when I began to look at where they were coming from, so many of them were coming from um, overseas. And so a webinar was not necessarily convenient for them to absorb, but an ebook they could download pretty easily. So part of it was their technology and their speed and so forth. Um, so worst case scenario, 
um, I would provide them something that's visual, like a webinar or a, um, a video Slide. chat like this or slides or something, and then maybe take that and have it transcribed. And there's a website and just totally blanking on it, but I know that you guys Speaker know text. that. Speaker text, there's another what's speech pad. Is that what it is? I forget. Anyway, oh, yeah, yeah. I think that's one also. Yeah. Speech pad. Yeah. I use speaker text. And they'll, the they'll trans transcribe your audio for you like a dollar a minute. And so, I'm um, sorry, transcribe your video, which in essence is an audio as you think about it. Right. Um, so, for just a very small investment, you could create a transcript of your, um, your free giveaway as well. And then, what I would do in um, Google Analytics, you can see uh, whether they're consuming, what they're consuming, and then you can make a choice whether uh, in the future you're going to do that. Again, it's going to absolutely depend on your audience, you know, what, what is their um, demographic makeup, and then also the level of material you're teaching. So you might be teaching, I don't know, nuclear physics, in which case I'm thinking maybe a little ebook probably isn't right, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> part of it depends on is there a visual component? Um, can you simplify complicated information uh, in a delivery method that makes it easy for them to consume? Mm -hmm. So without knowing a lot of specifics, that would be like the general information I give you. And, and um, let me know, is that putting you on the right track or yeah. has that? Perfect. I'm loving it. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah, Excellent. I, I'll just jump in here because I know Joselito um, <laughs> also that that I think it depends on what the content is mm -hmm. also that that you I mean, but, well, Karen said that. I mean, I know it's not nuclear physics, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and so it could be not necessarily a video where it's you talking. I mean, that could be a talking head, but it could also be webinar style where there's slides and a voiceover uh, so that there is that visual uh, component too that you also um, transcribe. But I think offering at least the two methods mm -hmm. um, so of reading and um, and watch audio yeah. you know whatever whether it's audio i mean it could be that people want to be able to have the mp3 i mean that's one of the reasons why i strip the audio out of our um our videos from from the online visibility challenges some people want to be able to listen to the mp3 when they're you know on their treadmill or whatever right exactly <laughs> exactly i don't know that's not what i would want to listen to when i'm on a treadmill you know, but <laughs> Because you're not listening to business topics while you're walking endlessly is so, so entertaining. Yeah, it's, it depends on what it is. So, yeah. yeah. Anything else, Jose Lito? No, I'm good. Thank you. Good luck. Well, thanks. Uh, now you're not a lab virgin anymore. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Anybody else want to? You can just click the X out. Yeah, there we go. Okay, we're gonna get uh, Mayana. I was hoping Mayanna would want to come on board. Hey, Mayanna, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. And I'm sorry I actually missed the first part of the show. I'm going to go back and listen to the recording because, Karen, I'm very interested in this topic. I teach oh, quite a bit. I do a lot of training. They're live trainings, video tutorials, and that kind of thing. So I so appreciate you doing that survey. Thank you very much. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, I do have a question for you, though. Um, especially now that I'm teaching on Udemy as well, I have private membership sites and I want to get more eyeballs on it. So I'm willing to trade price for volume uh, with Udemy and other formats like that. And that's what it's all about is volume. And some of the things that I see happening there are people to drive up the number of students that they have. Uh, they give away the course for free and they just blanket out the coupons and that kind of thing to people who may not be interested. They just grab up a free coupon and because it's lifetime, they take the course anywhere. So there's no scarcity. There's no time limit. There's nothing that you can do to really drive folks into this. And so they have a thousand students and no reviews or what I've also found with free courses like that, you know, if they do it for free and then switch it to paid when they do get reviews, they're very low compared to a paid course. So, um, you know, in these teaching things, you use those as a sales funnel, right? You give away a mm -hmm. lot of free material. Mm -hmm. uh, I do the same thing. I do free webinar, uh, uh, yeah, webinars that are free, zero pitch. It's just all help. It shows my expertise and people come in and hire me. So on one hand, sometimes giving it away for free gets me 
lots of money on the back end because people want to hire me because of the expertise. But when it comes to these courses, even though I'm showing them the expertise, it seems like the lower I put the dollar value, the less I make. I end up getting those low pay, high demand people. <laughs> no, and I don't know I that. Price it too high, <laughs> folks are like, yeah, for my demographic, they're the yeah. DIY people. I can't really price it way up to the real value that it's worth because I can't get people that foot in the door thing. Once they get in there, they're like, wow, I would have paid twice for this. And it's like, yeah, if I'd marketed it twice, you never would have bought it. What so, do you do with this? So here's a couple thoughts. So you want to you want to have as many people take your class as possible because it's a marketing tool for you for more services on the back end. Right. My feeling is this. There is a huge amount of free content out there. And so if you offer something for free, people don't feel any compulsion to um, consume it. And your biggest problem is you know, they have a thousand students, but no one's consuming it. Um, and they don't necessarily value the information. And mm -hmm. so consider the possibility of either um, if you have something that's free now, consider the possibility of doing it as a low price, you know, $9, $19, something like that, just to kind of get people to make some sort of financial commitment because the people who are willing to stick their hand in their pocket to pay 20 bucks for a class or a hundred bucks for a class are more likely also going to be the people who are going to buy your higher end things. There's just such a competition for free right now that people don't see free as valuable. And, and, and I'm the worst. I have a million eBooks on my hard drive and a million audios and a million videos that I need to watch and I never do. And you all know yeah. that because you're the same. Um, so, so is free a marketing technique that's working for you and it sounds like sometimes it is but it sounds like sometimes it's not and so i don't know that i would go free in the U udemy classes because i don't know that that's going to be really helpful and then the other piece that when i'm looking at this is when you are um teaching these classes what can you do to to do something extra or something special that makes this class so unique that people are going to be willing to talk about it because I would rather have 20 people in a paid class who are ecstatic about it than a thousand people who couldn't really care. I, I want to work with the people who are motivated. And so um, you need to be asking yourself, who are you trying to attract to these classes personality wise, as well as skill level, um, and then make choices based on what would that personality style do? Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. And I didn't go the free route on Udemy. Mm -hmm. I'm not Good. going to. I don't want to devalue things at that level. I mean, they already do 10 bucks sales now for $300 products. And so I'm not going to devalue it all the way down to free or something like that because yeah, it really doesn't attract the right people for the very reasons that you said. But in these reviews, if they can get that part of it for free, just see what the problems are. It shows the expertise of somebody who can do something for them. It's almost like a pre-interview to be hired yes and, yes and so for those kinds of things i guess they do work but uh, i see what you're saying and and make sure that i'm hitting my target audience by their willingness to invest yeah you know, i uh, i'm sorry excuse me i have a question for you mayanna because you've really done the research on udemy and this may help some other people who may be considering that is that um i know you have two courses on there now and do you you, uh, you they're video courses which are mostly what the Udemy classes are right mm -hmm. but do you also offer other formats because this was really we were looking at you know how people learn or what how they prefer to learn if they prefer you know yes. to read or watch videos and that sort of thing mm -hmm. do you offer a mix of of content yes style? I do. not on Udemy though uh it, you can offer a mix of content they require that you have your course be 60 percent videos Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. But they do encourage you to mix it up. As a matter of fact, Udemy has their own course on how to create a course on Udemy. Oh, good. It's 47 <laughs> lectures long, and those are not all videos. I mean, it is a course on marketing 101. That's yeah. really what it's about. It is a beautiful thing to take. And it not only teaches you Udemy, it teaches you how to sell, uh, create a high quality product and sell it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's right. really good that way, but you can put other kinds of content on it. I'm using this as the video component where you get a foundation laid. It's the base of it. 
and as an upsell into my private training, which is live. And right. it's, you know, a much higher value there because I'm giving you my individual attention. It's not a um, generic course and videos right, right. have to be necessarily generic. Right. Okay. And the other thing you have to be careful of with free training to pay training is that you, we know that people are motivated by being in some sort of discomfort or some sort of pain. I'm assuming emotional, not physical. Um, but that if you give them enough free training that that pain is relatively taken away, even just a little bit, then they're not going to have a motivation to pay. So you need to be very careful that you don't oversaturate with them with so much free stuff that they have no either no interest in the paid stuff because the free stuff answered their question or that they're so inundated with your free stuff they can't keep up with it. And so right. they're like, oh, well, if if this is what the free thing is like or the, the low price thing is like, what's the paid thing going to be like and am I going to be able to keep up with it? And that's a real concern. I don't think they're saying that because they feel like they can't learn. It's just they have oh, so many demands on their time. And so right. how can you, as part of your marketing, sell them the idea that you're going to help them step by step through this and you're not going to overwhelm them, but it's going to be so content rich that they're going to be helpful. And as a matter of fact, you're going to help them figure out how to implement and you're not going to just give them information and have them have, to, have them figure out the rest on their own. Well, I, I do want to have a little follow up question. And, and Denise, I'll be um I know you're coming up on time here probably for this, yeah. so, um, but when you were doing that testing to see how people like to learn, of course, when Udemy or platforms like that require you to have so much in video, it is what it is. So, I mean, that's what I'm expecting on that platform. <clears throat> but for other things, I just find my, my students like the videos because they're working it's not a mental thing. They're trying to get something done with click here, click that. And it's got to be a video showing them how to do it. So overall in your survey, that's one of the things that I didn't see is what kind of material is it that people are preferring to read or do by video and that kind of thing. Yeah. And it wasn't a question that we asked. We didn't, we didn't ask them, well, for this kind of topic, what do you prefer in this kind? So we didn't ask them that level of detail, but, um, you know, I mean, you know your audience. If, if it's if you're teaching them something that's step by step and there's a lot of steps and a lot of clicks, well, maybe a video. But wouldn't it be cool if you had a video with a transcript with some screen captures in it? If it's something they have to click, um, so that they could then say, okay, I can have it in front of me, and I go, I look at the page, I look at the screen, I look at the page, I look at the screen. Yeah. It's 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 how are they going to not just absorb the information, but how are they actually practically in, in real life going to use it? Okay. Thank you Excellent. so much. I appreciate that it. Help? Good. Good. Thanks for popping in, Mana. Well, um, this this um, was great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just realized it's been an hour. <laughs> I didn't really I didn't really think we'd go that long. Um, where can people find you, uh, Karen? On the yeah, web. So, so my main website is passionforbusiness.com. That's my business consulting and my own uh, school for the self-employed website. And then if they're interested in mastermind groups, they can go to thesuccessalliance.com. Excellent. Excellent. So um, you can, I have posted the links for, to take the survey and also to download the, uh, the survey results. If you just want to skip the survey, if you're, if you're thinking about, uh, creating any kind of survey for your own audience, then I do recommend that you go through Karen's survey, uh, just see how she set it up and how she's asked the questions. It's a very good model to um, use when planning your own survey. Um, th though this is not an official uh, episode of Adventures in Visibility, I do have my show Adventures in Visibility about once a month, and you are invited to subscribe to get advance notice of new shows. And there's one coming up in a couple of weeks or a week. I have to check my calendar. Uh, you can go to adventuresinvisibility.com to sign up. If you prefer to listen to it, you can also uh, get it as an audio on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. And um, 
to do that, to get the podcast, you can go to adventuresinvisibilitypodcast.com. So Karen, thank you so much for being here with me today. This has been really um, enlightening and there's been a lot of good stuff to think about for those of us who are training and teaching. And as I said, most of the people I know are doing it in some way, shape or form. So I really appreciate you sharing um, you know, the survey, how you did it, and what we need to take away from it. It's very, very helpful. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Denise. All right. I will turn off the recording and uh, 